after lunch. This is exciting. Um, so as you know, we're going to be talking about automating stateful applications with Kubernetes operators. Kicked my water over. That's a good start. Um, I'm going to put that here. What that is going to entail is basically an overview of like why do you care about operators in the first place? What are they? What can they do for you? What problems are they solving? Um, how they work? And then we'll transition a little bit into things like the operator framework and the SDK if you're in a situation where maybe it makes sense to build operators yourself or just use them uh, to solve some of your problems. So um, to make sure that we stay on track, I'm just going to jump right into it. So I'm Jan Kleiner, as you know. Um, and OpenShift is one of the things I work on, which of course is a distribution of Kubernetes, if you're not familiar. Now I suspect with this audience, how many of you are at least familiar with Kubernetes? So that's a whole lot. So I'm not going to get into the, into the weeds of like what's Kubernetes, um, though it is important to have that foundational knowledge for operators to make any sense. So you're probably pretty familiar with the fact that Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform helps you manage containerized applications at scale and automate a lot of the stuff that you would normally have to do yourself. Um, we will skip this completely because you probably know what it helps you do. Um, just to kind of hit home this, there's a bunch of native primitive types in Kubernetes, things like pods, services, deployments. Kubernetes knows what those are. You can say kubectl get pods and it's like, okay, I know what a pod is. Um, and that's important for later. So you can manage your Kubernetes cluster using the Kubernetes API or through command line tools and things like that, of course. Um, an object definition looks something like this. So this is part of what um, some YAML for setting up a pod would look like. Um, you can see it's got a type, some metadata, in this case a container spec. Um, and we talked about Kubernetes there for about two minutes, but that's not what we're here to talk about really. We're here to talk about operators. So why should you care about them in the first place? Scaling stateless applications on Kubernetes is actually pretty easy. There's built-in types like replica set that do a lot of this for you. So you can run a command like this, kubectl scale, tell it what you want to scale and how many uh, replicas you want, and it'll just take care of that for you. So that looks something like this. So you can see here we've, we're issuing our scale command. Um, and one of the cool things that I think is kind of unique about Kubernetes is that it's so declarative. So you've got your desired state, how you want the world to look, and then you've got your actual state. So you can see we're telling it our desired state is that we want three replicas. Our current state is that we only have one. So when we issue that scale command, Kubernetes is going to do whatever needs to be done um, to bring us up to have our actual state more in line with the desired state so that we have three pods running. Um, nothing too new there, right? So that's easy. Scaling up stateless applications, you just do things like this and you're, you're all set. Um, but what about applications that store data? Or what about applications that have their own notion of a cluster? So for example, if you are running um, some kind of database that had masters and worker nodes, um, and then you're trying to run that on Kubernetes, and you need to be able to handle things like failures and upgrades and, and patching and things like that, it becomes more complex. Now again, creating a database on Kubernetes is also easy. You can run something like this, basically tell it what image you want to run and it'll spin it up and you've got your database. This is a made up database, but it could be Redis Enterprise, it could be whatever, MySQL, whatever it is that you want. It's easy to get it up and running. Uh, but running it over time is harder. Doing some of those actions that we talked about, like patching and upgrades, handling failure, healing, um, all of that, that's, that's much more complex. So anytime you've got these stateful applications, and it doesn't have to just be a database, that's just kind of our easy example that's a go-to, but you're gonna have to deal with these types of situations. So resize, upgrade, reconfigure, backup, healing, and with applications particularly that have their own notion of a cluster, that can be really complicated. There can be a lot of other actions that have to take place before you can complete whatever it is you're trying to do, and it may not even be just the particular application that you're working with that has to change. There may be other resources in your cluster that need to be um, dealt with as well. So this is true. Any application on any platform might only have to be installed once, but it's going to need to be configured, managed, and upgraded over time, over the course of the time that you're running that application. Um, upgrading, patching, things like that, of course, are critical to security, and running secure apps is critical to your business. 
And when it comes down to it, anything that's not automated is slowing you down. So whenever you've got to have, you know, people taking manual actions to do whatever it is in your system, that, that requires the resources from them that they could be spending on other things. It is just going to, to make things go slower. So if only Kubernetes knew, what am I trying to talk about here? Basically, what if Kubernetes knew all of the things um, that let's say your best database administrator knows about how to actually run this, we're just gonna call it production ready database, run this production ready database on Kubernetes. So this is John, he's been working at your company for let's say four years and he does have all of that knowledge. He's got this figured out for your environment um, he knows what is needed to get that database installed. He knows how all the steps that are needed to kind of like manage it in a production ready way. He can handle backing up and all of that stuff. But there is only one of him and his time is limited. And anytime someone in your company needs these resources, they need some of his time. And some companies, some organizations aren't even gonna have somebody like John. Um, so it, there may just be too much of a barrier to being able to run these types of stateful applications on Kubernetes if you don't have somebody or some resource with the knowledge of how to actually do that in a reasonable, safe way over time. So what if we could take all of his operational knowledge and kind of package it up, kind of turn it into like a, basically put it into code and put it in a box, what I'm trying to show you here. What if you could take all that operational knowledge and package it up? And then you could take that knowledge that's all packaged up and you could, ins you could install that on any Kubernetes cluster running in any enterprise on any um, cloud and have that production ready database or whatever your stateful software is able to run um, on any cluster. And it would have that knowledge embedded with it of what to do when, when it needs to be installed, configured, backed up, all of that. So that's really what we're talking about. That red's a little hard to see, sorry about that. Uh, that's what we're really talking about when we talk about the operator pattern. So we're talking about automated software managers that handle the installation and life cycle of Kubernetes applications. Or what I mean by Kubernetes applications is applications that run on Kubernetes and also kind of interact with certain parts of the API or the system itself. So kind of Kubernetes native applications. And so how does it work? So there's already ways of extending Kubernetes through the API. So this is not anything new or specific to operators, um, but we use custom controllers and um, custom resource definitions. So the way that these kind of work together, if you're not familiar, is so the custom controller is going to know about your particular resource type or application. And it's going to be watching um, for changes, for different events that it needs to take action on, it's gonna look at the state of the system and say, am I in the state I need to be? And if not, the knowledge of what to do in the if not case is going to be built into that controller. So if the if not is like, oh, I'm supposed to have you know, three instances of whatever this is and I only have two, it's going to know what needs to happen, all the things that need to happen to bring that into the right state. Um, and then the custom resource definition is what lets your cluster know what a production ready database type is in Kubernetes um, so that that custom controller can watch and interact with it. And to look at that in a more visual way, you know, the, the dotted line, big square, that's your controller that's watching and running a reconciliation loop. And then you've got your custom resource um, that interacts with it. So here, here we have the, the blue kind of rounded rectangle is your cluster. I'm a very, very good uh, artist. And then we have our, our controller down here in the bottom that's just sitting and watching and waiting. Now here's our custom resource definition for our production ready database. Um, it's got a name in the metadata, that's not very exciting, but in our spec you can see we're saying we want a cluster size of three, two read replicas in a particular version to be running. So when that's applied to the system, the controller is going to see that and do the arrow with the dots and the circle is whatever it takes. I don't have to know whatever it takes as a user. Whoever wrote the operator knows that, and so I get the benefit of that knowledge. Um, the controller is going to do whatever needs to be done to bring up those three uh, replicas that I want on the system. So that is a very simplified version of kind of how that works. 
So I don't like talking about things in an abstract way. So let's look at a simple example um, of an operator. This is the etcd operator. If you're not familiar with etcd, it's a distributed key value store that Kubernetes actually uses for storing cluster state. And here's an example of what our um, custom resource might look like for an etcd cluster. You can see that kind is etcd cluster. Um, and then we have our spec, which says we want it to be of size three and we want version 3.1.0. So just remember that for the next slide. Um, so with that in mind, we have this loop going on here. So in the observed state, I can't read that, so I'm gonna read it to you from over here. Um, our, our etcd cluster has got two running pods right now. We know we want three. And they're running, one's running version 3.0.9, the other's running 3.1.0. So in the analyze step of that loop, we're basically going to say, well, what's different from what we wanted? We wanted them all to be 3.1.0, and we want to have three of them. So the action that the controller is going to take is whatever needs to happen to get us to that desired configuration, including the things listed here. But there's probably a lot more to each of those steps than what's listed on the screen. Let's do a time check here. All right. So instead of trying to play this from the presentation, I'm going to do it this way because I always accidentally advance the slide by mistake. So this is something that you can do yourself. So I have just done a screen grab, like a screen capture of going through one of the tutorials on learn.openshift.com where you can go through the process of deploying and using the etcd operator. So if you want to try this yourself, it's always available. But um, let's, let's see what that looks like. This is a shortened version here. All right, so first we're going to create the CRD for the operator. Hopefully y'all can read that. It looks not too, too small. So we're, we already have these YAML files created. We're just going to run create on them. So now we have our CRD. There's some RBAC stuff that has to happen for the operators. Every operator's got its own requirements, but we need a service account. We need a role and a role binding. So we're doing that now um, to get that all set up. I feel like I'm a fast typer until I watch my typing go on the screen and I'm like, man, it's not as fast as I thought. All right, so now we have all of that set up. The next thing we're gonna do is create the deployment um, that, can, that has that container image. So we've got another YAML file for that. All right, so now we have that operator's been created. We're gonna check and make sure that the deployment was actually created. We can see the deployment there called that CD operator. And we can see that we've got a pod running as well. So now we can actually define an etcd cluster by referring to that custom resource. So now the cluster, Kubernetes cluster is actually going to know what an etcd cluster is. And I have to pause it here so we can look. Um, so when we, what we're doing here is we're looking at that YAML for the etcd operator uh, CR. Um, you can see here we've got the kind of etcd cluster and we're specifying what, what we want. The same, I think, almost the same as what we showed in the original example, size of 3 and version 3.1.10. So that's what we're um, going to run create on here in just a sec, I think. Okay. All right, so now that we've done that, we can make sure that that cluster object was created because now Kubernetes knows what SCD clusters are. Before, if you had run that, it would have been like, I don't know what that resource is. But now it knows. Um, and what we see here, let me just pause it. Now we're, we're trying to get all the pods that have this label, all the pods that are these SCD cluster um, pods. And what we should see is we asked for three, so we should see three eventually come up and running. They're coming. OK, whoop, I went too fast there. Um, so those are up and running now. There's, there's a tiny bit of hand waving here because I couldn't show two terminals side by side. So in another terminal, now we have connected to, um, to our etcd cluster and we're just using um, the etcd um, command line tool to actually just like put and retrieve something uh, from the data store to make sure that it actually works. So kind of just proving to ourselves that this did actually create a usable um, etcd cluster. So we put it, and that will get it back out. And then at that point, we'll be satisfied that it worked, um, and we can go back. 
All right, so back to our original terminal. Now we can look at some of the things that you can do with operators. For example, we're going to scale up our etcd cluster from three to five members. Um, we're going to do that by running a patch command to basically change it in the spec, um, change the three to a five. And then as soon as we do that, I'll pause so you can see what I'm talking about. So we just are changing the spec size to five where it was a three before. And now we should be able to watch those two new pods get created as soon as that's done. So you can see they're starting to come up here. Um, and we'll have one up and running, and then the other will come up and running shortly after that. So this is a simple example of the types of things that operators can do for you. We could have asked it to change the version and seen what happened in that case, um, but in the interest of time and not making you guys watch a really long video, um, that is just kind of a quick overview of, of how you would install and use an operator like etcd, which is a pretty simple example. So hopefully that makes it a little more concrete And as I mentioned before, so you can try this and other hands-on tutorials yourself um, at learn.openshift.com slash operator framework. I think there's maybe somewhere between six and nine of them now. Um, there's also kind of a refresher of the Kubernetes API if you, if you need that before you do some of these other things. Um, but there are some good tutorials there that help you kind of get some of this experience yourself and they're always available. And you can use operators today. So if you haven't seen it, operatorhub.io is a website where you can see a bunch of operators that have been created by the community um, and with instructions of how to install them on your Kubernetes clusters yourself. Um, there's even more operators listed in, I wanna say it's in the operator framework GitHub organization under a repo called Awesome Operators. Uh, I think I may have the link at the end of this, but if not, I can add it before I share the slides. But there's like an even more um, exhaustive list of some of the ones created by the community there. And that's changing and being added to all the time. This is not to be, conf well, sort of to be confused. Similar to um, within OpenShift 4, there is an operator hub within there as well, which is kind of a subset of what is um, in operatorhub.io to just kind of simplify the process in OpenShift of installing these operators on your cluster if you're an admin. So if you are, for some reason, creating an operator that would be of use to other people, you can also um, have this added here as well. A lot of what you'll see, and I think a lot of what is often the use case for creating an operator, is um, services like databases that, you know, like maybe, I think Redis has a Redis Enterprise operator. That's something that they created or at least worked with some of the community to create. And then that way people can take advantage of that and we're not all out trying to write our own Redis Enterprise operator because that's not the most efficient use of, of all of our time. But so you can take advantage of the fact that somebody has built these for you if they're solving a problem you need to solve. But there might be some cases where you are interested in creating one yourself for some you know, specific problem that you need to solve in your organization. Um, and there is the operator framework that I'll tell you about now. So this is kind of an umbrella over several different projects, um, including the operator lifecycle manager, which you can think of as an operator for operators. So where operators handle the installation, configuration, lifecycle of an application, the operator lifecycle manager does all of that for your operators. So. There's also operator metering, which is going to handle, I mean, basically, gathering metrics over time, things like that. And then the SDK, so if you are in a situation where it makes sense or you wanna explore what it would be like to create an operator, um, the SDK, you don't have to use it, but you can use it and it will um, give you some kind of shortcuts and scaffolding to create operators yourself. I didn't have a slide for this, so let me just tell you a little bit about it. So the SDK currently supports creating operators with Helm, Ansible or Go, so you can choose from one of those three very different ways of creating an operator. Um, and it's going to have um, scaffolding so that you can hook into like the common events or features that an operator might need to have, and then just add in your custom logic basically and not have to write the whole thing from scratch. Um, it's also going to have available certain like hooks into the Kubernetes API um, that you might commonly need. So it's just a time saver, but again, you, you can build an operator. Let's say you wanted to create one in Java for 
whatever reason, you can certainly do that. We just don't have the SDK support available. So you'd have to do a little bit more work. Um, and then kind of a final note here on operator maturity model. So not all operators are created equally. Sometimes that's by design. Um, there's kind of this five phase maturity model or like you can kind of think of it as like a complexity model of what operators support. So like phase one is kind of the simplest where it just handles installation. Um, and then you can see it kind of progresses through where it handles upgrades or the whole life cycle. Um, phase four is including metrics and logging and all of that metering stuff. Um, and then phase five, ooh, that's tough. Phase five um, kind of handles just about everything. So that's just something to keep in mind. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if you look on Operator Hub, I think they typically will list the like what phase uh, most of the operators support. So you kind of know what you're getting in that operator. All right, so a bunch of resources here, and I don't actually have the awesome operators on there, but you would find it underneath operator-framework on GitHub. Um, you would find it as one of the repos there. It's a cool list that you can find lots and lots and lots of options. Um, there's also some other resources. Um, if you're looking for something kind of high level that's not super technical that you want to share with somebody on your team to kind of introduce them to like, what are operators? Um, this second link here is good for that. Um, a link to operatorhub.io, um, a blog post that kind of introduces the framework, and then again, those, two, those resources, um, the tutorials on learn.openshift.com if you want to try them out. And I think we're actually okay on time. So thank you. Do you have any questions? Okay, so the question was, they've been trying out some operators on their own clusters, and some operators will be um, cluster-wide when you install them. They'll be installed with cluster-wide scope, and sometimes they'll be installed with a particular namespace, just to a particular namespace. Um, and he's asking, why is that and what are the use cases? Yeah. That's a super question. <laughs> it is a fact that that's the case. I think... I want to give you a good answer and not an off the top of my head answer. So if you don't mind, I can find you later um, and I can get your contact info or give you my card. But I know that we, like a lot of things, let's say for example that you wanted people to use, and I'm using an OpenShift example just because this is something I actually have done in my work. So it's a use case I've done. If I want everyone that's using the cluster that I'm making available to have access to OpenShift pipelines, for example. We install that via an operator. I want that available in every project, not just a particular project or set of projects. That operator, I would definitely want to install at, or have the admin on my cluster install at um, cluster-wide scope. Uh, but there may be things, particularly if you have a bunch of different teams, like development teams, other teams doing stuff on a cluster, and certain operators, certain things that you're installing may not be relevant to everybody. So we have some workshops that we create that we install um, with operators, and that's certainly not something we'd want available to every single namespace or project on the cluster. So there's some of that, but I feel like there's a better answer I can give you if I just uh, poke around a little bit and think harder. All right, well, I will be around this afternoon and also tomorrow, and I'm planning to go to the event tonight, so if you have any other questions or things you wanna chat about, I'll be around. Thank you so much.